house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she brake the box and poured it out on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare, that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house. The master saith, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth, and came into the city, and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. 
neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him, and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him, and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him, and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword, and smote a servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief, with swords and with staves, to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him, and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth, and fled from them, naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, and the elders, and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants, and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain, and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further's witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. And Lord, that your word would be as a fire shut up in my bones. In, in Jesus' name, amen. So we see here in, in Mark 14, obviously we're going through, uh, through this you know, portion where we see G, uh, Judas's uh, betrayal and also Peter's denial as we go through. And so uh, as, as last week, or sorry, as a couple of weeks ago when we went into Mark chapter 13 about the end times, that is known as the day of conflict. 
uh, that we see there. The day of conflict includes, you know, from Mark chapter, halfway through like Mark chapter 11 through chapters 12 and as well as 13. Going from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders asking by what authority Jesus is allowed to do the things that he was saying and was doing uh, to where Jesus is telling the Pharisees to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's. And also, what the greatest command is. And so as we, as we went through this, as he tells you know, the disciples of what's to come in the end times, and the fact is, is that we can see in, the, uh, in just that portion of Scripture why this is known as the day of conflict. Because there's a lot of things that Jesus is telling people that it's going to cause conflict. He is telling, for one thing, render under Caesar. What is Caesar? He's, he's telling them, you know, by what authority that he is doing these things. All this stuff is stirring up conflict. It's not conflict, you know, with Jesus because Jesus is, you know, is the son of God, right? But it's causing conflict probably, you know, with his disciples, but also with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all these things, you know, uh, that are happening. And so they're very controversial subjects that he's talking about. And this morning, the days that it's going to include is the day of preparation and the day of suffering. It's going to include these things. Preparation for what? Preparation in the fact of like the trial, this mistrial, and all these different arguments and everything else, and the fact that he's going to, he's preparing himself to be the Passover lamb, right? He's preparing himself to die for us on the cross. And the day of suffering is obviously because of the fact that he's getting ready to be mistreated. We actually see a little bit of that when he's beginning to be slapped in the face. And later on, obviously, he's going to have, you know, the flesh, you know, torn from his body and beaten, and he's going to be nailed to a cross as well. But that's, that'll be uh, next week. And so the, the title of this, uh, this morning's message is Don't Be a Sellout. Is Don't Be a Sellout. And I began to sit there and think about, you know, different names for a sellout. And I, I, I thought back to when I was younger, and it was funny because I was mentioning it, you know, what's another word? And one of the people I asked, they said, you know, they said, I don't know what that word is, and it's poser. I said, don't be a poser. And they said, well, what's a poser? I've never heard that word. And I was thinking, well, let me think about it. When that word was popular, it was about 20-something years ago, and this person was probably a child. So they probably, man, I feel old. i just tell you that right now. But a poser is basically somebody who acts, you know, they put on this front. They're posing as there's something special, as there's something great. But in fact, that they're actually not that person. Another you know, term you know, for this would be an imposter. Somebody that is, you know, it sounds like they're on your side, but they're not. They're an imposter. And, uh, you know, my wife you know, got me to think about this. My, my daughter likes to watch, these, you know, uh, watch, watch uh, Kids Baking Championship. And they have a, a category on there called dessert and pasta. All right? Dessert and pasta. And so what they ended up you know, doing is they'll bring out like a hamburger and french fries. And they'll say, Okay, you need to make this look, you know, be a dessert, but it needs to look like a cheeseburger and french fries. Or it's a steak and potatoes, and they need, you know, it needs to be a dessert, but it has to look like a steak and, you know, and baked potato, okay? And so they'll go on there, and, you know, some of them are, you know, are pretty creative in it, but the whole thing is, is that, I mean, for a person that wouldn't know, you come up there and you're thinking you're getting a steak and potato, and then all of a sudden you're going, well, this tastes like cake. What is, what is the deal with this? And so the thing is, is we don't want to be a sellout. We don't want to be an imposter. We don't want to be a poser, right? And so if we look at this on the first couple of verses, I'm going to talk to you, uh, talk to you for a moment, uh, you know, a moment this morning about not being a sellout, not being a poser, not being an imposter. And so the first por- uh, portion we're going to look at is Judas and the alabaster box. Judas and the alabaster box, and there's songs that have been written about the alabaster box and, and all these things um, as well. But in the uh, verses 1 and 2, we see that the chief priests and scribes, along with the elders of the people, go to the high priest to discuss how to capture and ultimately kill Jesus through subtlety and by craft. What does that mean, by craftiness? They're trying to take Jesus by surprise, but they're trying to do it in a way that doesn't get them in trouble. Because you know why? Because they still feared the people. They were afraid that if they were to just nab them or in front of everybody and take them away, that that would cause an uproar in the crowd. Why? Because the people loved him. People loved Jesus. They loved what he was saying. They loved the fact that he was going against the lies of the Pharisees, the lies of the, of the Sadducees, the lies of, of, of the scribes. And so they are still afraid of what's going on or what's going to happen if they were to do that. So they're trying to do it very, 
very sneakily, very crafty, all right? Uh, you know, a, a lot of craftiness, and they're trying to sit there and just grab them and kind of, you know, hopefully not cause an uproar as they do it, okay? And so this is what we see. Also in verse 1, we see that there are two feasts happening. There's the Feast of the Passover, and there's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And we talked about this a few uh, weeks ago at Easter, that Passover is considered to be a special Sabbath. We find this in Leviticus 23. But we see that the Passover in Leviticus, or sorry, in Exodus chapter 12, it talks about what needs to happen in, uh, in Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5. It says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take uh, to them every man a lamb, according uh, to the house of their fathers, and a lamb, uh, a lamb for, uh, for a house. And if the household uh, be too little for the lamb, let him and his uh, neighbor next unto his house take, uh, sorry, take it according to the, the number of souls. Every man according uh, to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And so as we, we see this, we know that this festival is to celebrate that. And so um, if you've ever been a part of, you know, I remember a few years back, actually about probably about 10 years ago when I say this, that, you know, at the church that we were at, they, they did a, a Seder meal, a Passover Seder meal, and you got to see how the different aspects, you know, were to show them Jesus in the Passover, that the Passover, obviously we know the Passover lamb, that you know, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So you see why the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of them would have a problem with Jesus. Because he was announced when he first came, when John the Baptist saw him, who does he say he is? This is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Pharisees and Sadducees would have seen this as you know, blasphemous because they know who he's referring to. They, re, they know that he's referring to the Passover lamb that takes away the sins at, at the Passover feast, right? And so when they see all this stuff happening, and they see all these things, and this is what Jesus is beginning to fulfill. And if you're beginning to wonder, like, you know, some of the things that I'm talking about, the day of conflict, the day of preparation, the day of suffering, we do have this available over on the, uh, on the, at the foyer as well, and it goes through... The, the last week of Jesus' life, and it will tell you all this stuff, and it does it in order so you can kind of figure out, okay, where are they talking about? What is this talking about? And all that kind of stuff. And so if I refer to it, I'm referring to this, you know, this paper, you know, um, you know this, this uh, uh, paper that details that as we go. But so we see this whole thing that Jesus is the Passover lamb. That's what he's doing. He, because of why? Because he died as the Passover lamb once for all. Once for all, what does that mean? You don't have to keep continually getting saved over and over again. If he died for you and you believed on him, you got saved, he died for you once for all. Because the Bible even says that, you, you know, that if you keep coming back and you keep whatever, and you're, he's like, you can't keep on killing Jesus over and over again. You can't keep on putting him on the cross over and over again. It doesn't happen. He died for you once for all, and that is it. Amen? And so in verse 3, we also see that this corresponds with John chapter 12. Verse 3 of Mark, Mark chapter 14, uh, verse 3, it also, it parallels John chapter 2, uh, sorry, John chapter 12 and verses 2 and 3, that we are told that Mary, who is the sister of Martha and Lazarus, breaks and open an alabaster box of very expensive ointment. And this ointment, it says, when it says it's very expensive, they're not kidding. Today's value of this ointment that she, you know, that she breaks out, perfume that she breaks out, would be worth $1,800. $1,800. I don't know about you, I don't spend that much on myself to smell that good. I, don't, I ain't going to do it. But this also is, a, is used, um, this is spikenard, uh, ointment is also used not only for perfume, but it's also a medicine, and they also, also, obviously, as we can see, use it for burial purposes as well. And this thing is, the reason why it's probably so uh, expensive, because it is medicine, because it is perfume, because it is used in these ceremonies, but also the distance that they would have to travel to get it. Because this, the spikenard is only grown in the Himalayas of Nepal, China, and India. 
So they would have to bring this a great distance from where it is. And so the fact that it has medicinal purposes and perfume and, and all these uh, different uses is of great value, but also the distance they would have to travel in order to bring it. And she comes over and she, and she breaks it open. She breaks open this box. You know, John says she, you know, that she, uh, she pours it over his, his head and his beard. And then also, as we see in Mark 14, it says, on, upon his feet. And she begins to wipe her hair upon his, you know, wipe, her, wipe his feet with her hair. And so we see this act of worship, you know, that's beginning to place. So in John chapter 12, verse 5, the Bible says that Judas is the one who says this. He says, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? You're like, oh, Judas cares. Judas cares about the poor. He's, he's like, you're wasting all of this. He says, you know, why would you do that? We could have taken that and sold it and we could have given it to the poor. It sounds like he's got good motives, right? That he's got good intentions. But we know that he does not. Because he didn't care about the poor. Because in the next verse in John chapter 12, verse 6, it says this. It says, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. He was a thief. He, take, he took care of the money. He was stealing money out of, out of the offering plate. He didn't care about the poor. He was going, hey, phew, that's worth $1,800. I'd like to have some of that. That's what, he's, that's what he's thinking. It's not the fact that he cares about it. He wants the money. This is, uh, this is what Judas is. And the, the thing is, is that the simple act of worship and love that Mary had towards her Savior was ridiculed by those around her. Because it was not just Judas Judas made the statement, Judas had a problem with it, but other people around the disciples also had an issue because when he brings it up, they were displeased too. They're like, yeah, that could have, uh, yeah, I see what he means. This could have been sold. This could have been used, you know, to help the poor. Why is, he, why, uh, why is she using this and, you know, in this way? And so what we need to, you know, this is the way we can apply these verses that I just talked about is that you do what God's word tells you to do, no matter what. Because you love and you worship him, don't listen to the naysayers. If you are worshiping the Lord, you're listening to God's word, you're reading his word, you're doing what God has you to do, you love him and everything else, don't listen to what everybody else says. Because no matter what happens, you're going to have people that are going to go against you saying, you know what, you don't really need to do that. You need to sell that so you can give it to the poor. You need to do this. You need to, if God's word tells you to do it, do it. If it doesn't, don't. But don't listen to the people around you because you know what? You have people out there that, you know, that you know, will claim that they know more about the Bible than you do. We have politicians that are telling you that it's okay to commit abortion. Yet the Bible strongly tells you not to. You have uh, you know, different people all over the place saying to do this and to do that and it's okay to do this. And then people wonder why. There's natural consequences for things. We were talking about this you know, in, our, in our Sunday school class this morning. Is that, you know what, you can do certain things. You, you may not, you know, lose your salvation. You're not going to lose your salvation over it, right? But there are natural consequences for it. Like say you're a glutton. What's a glutton? Somebody who eats too much. You say, you know, the Bible calls that a sin. It doesn't say, you know, oh, all of a sudden you ate too much. You went to that buffet, you ate too much. No, it says that there's a natural consequence. You may go to that buffet and go up there five times and then come back and go, oh man, my, the natural consequence is my stomach hurts right now. And I'm going to get fat. And I feel like I need to take some Tums. I mean, just all these things, these natural consequences that, you know, that will happen you know, because of these things. But the thing is, is that we, if we follow God's word, we, we listen to what God has to say for us, we don't, we don't end up having to uh, to go through those natural consequences. Like if we say, you know what? I'm going to go speed because I feel like I need to get there faster. What's the natural consequence? Well, there's a lot that could possibly happen. Number one, you can get a speeding ticket and, and then you lose money. That's a natural consequence. Or the fact is that you can speed and you can get into a car accident. That's a natural consequence. So there's a lot of things that God's words you know, tells us you know, that you say, well, the you know, Bible doesn't talk about speeding. It does tell you to obey the laws of the land as long as it does not go against God's word. And that would be the laws of the land. The reason why there's a speed limit is because you're supposed to go that fast. Not faster, but you're not supposed to go that fast, so that way you don't, you're not a hazard on the road. 
But anyways, let's go on to the next uh, portion that we're going to look at. We're going to look at. Uh, we're going to go down to uh, verses ten and eleven here in a moment. But next point I want to you know talk to you about is selling out to the crowd. All right, selling out to the crowd. Oftentimes we see this. We see one moment somebody is you know for somebody else. And then a couple days later, they're for something else. We see this happen at the beginning of this week, right? When Jesus you know, uh, rides in. He rides in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, right? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. A couple hours, you know, a couple of hours later you know, in Mark 14 or in Mark 15, we're going to see the fact that the crowd has all of a sudden went from Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him. Don't be a sellout because the crowd will change. We see that all over the place. I brought this up before, but we've seen stories where all of a sudden, you know, it comes out that somebody has done something and then, and then the media twists it and changes it to where all of a sudden you feel bad for the person that did wrong. Think about, you know, the, the Tennessee shooter that went into the, the Christian school. I know I bring that one up, but that's, that's probably the, the most recent one that I can sit there and think of that is, you know, the best one. Why? Because this... Uh, this transvestite comes in there, shoots nine-year-olds, shoots some older people, and the news media will have you believe that it's the Christian's fault. They say, well, it's because the Christians did this, this, and this. That that's, that's the reason why. No, you're responsible for your actions. I've never, you know, I, I mean, that is the most childish argument that I've ever seen. It reminds me of, like, things that my brother and I used to do to each other. For instance, my brother, you know, like there would be times where he would do like WWF moves. I know it's like WWE nowadays, but he would like suplex me. You know what a suplex is? You could take you up like this and like way up in the air and then you fall down on the thing. I needless to say, I got hurt. But all through those times where, you know, he would do those things to me, it was, you know, or I would do something to him back and forth. We go and we would all say, well, it's because he did it. I only did it because he did it. That's the same way that that Tennessee shooting is. You know what? The only re- the media will say the only reason why this transvestite did what she did was because of the Christians. And if you don't think that Christians are going to be persecuted, it's happening more and more. Christians are getting blamed more and more for things because supposedly we do all these bad things. You know, like, you know, love your neighbor. You know, that's a horrible thing to you know, follow, right? And so anyways, on this day of preparation, this is actually Tuesday evening, according to the Jewish calendar. And like I say, if, if any of the, you know, when I talk about the calendar, if it's something you're like, okay, that went over my head, pick that up the paper, it'll show it to you, and then you'll, uh, hopefully it'll make sense. But this is actually Tuesday evening on the Jewish calendar, but for us, it would be considered Wednesday morning. Why? Because remember, on the Jewish calendar, their day, you know, starts in darkness, but it ends in light. Kind of like what Jesus said, that he has brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's how their day goes. Our day, as as us following the the solar calendar, is that we start off in the light and end up in darkness. And it's God has it flipped backwards. He wants us to always mirror what Jesus Christ did. Every story that's in the Bible, yes, it has a natural uh, application to it, but it always points to Christ in some way. And so what we need to realize, so in this, like I said, this is actually uh, what they would consider to be Tuesday evening on the Jewish calendar because they start, um, like I said, uh, their day starts, uh, yeah, start, it, it's, it's uh, evening on the Jewish calendar and for us Wednesday morning. So remember, 6 p.m. is the start of their next day on the Jewish calendar, all right? And so what we need to realize, you know, that this is, that as we're talking about these, you know, this thing, it's, uh, you know, that it's. It's going to be you know, from uh, on Wednesday. It's going to be in the morning at six a.m. All right. And so, what we need uh, when we go down to verses ten and eleven, we see that Judas sells out Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. Now, I went online to try and figure out how much he sold the Savior for. How much this is, and this one was somewhat of a, a controversy. They know how much you know spikenard ointment cost back in the day, and how much it would be now. But this one was controversy because you're like, well, it depends on this if it's this type of coin or if it's this one, and if it's this kind of silver or this kind of silver. I was going, okay, could somebody just give me an idea? So, anyways, I say all that to one, or where one person said it, it was anywhere from ninety-one dollars 
to $441. That's approximate. Another person said that it was $20,400. So can you see that, you know, the, you know, you're going back and forth and you're going, what in the world are they talking about? But anyways, to me, even if it was $5 million that it was worth, it, you know what? You can't get me to sell out my Savior. That it doesn't matter the amount of money that it was worth. It was the fact that Judas said, you know what? I'm going to sell my Savior for some money. He was thinking about himself. Yet again, it's all about money for him. And, you know, the fact that in verse 11, you know, it reads, it says, And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought out how he might conveniently betray him. Convenient. We don't want to do anything hard, right? We want to do things the easy way, right? He doesn't want to you know, have to you know, fight the crowds in order to get them. So just like the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're looking for a way to kind of like craftily do this at this time. And so we look at, uh, when we go down to verses 12 through 16, as you notice, there's a lot of verses in this chapter, 72 to be exact. I may or may not read the verses. I'm just going to allude to, the, uh, uh, to those ones. And so in verses 12 through 16, Jesus and his disciples are ready to celebrate the Passover meal. So he tells his disciples, he's prophesying because this has not happened. He says, you know what? He says, you're going to follow a man carrying a pitcher of water, and you're going to ask him for a room to eat the Passover in. And, the man is going to get, uh, and this man is going to give you a, a, a large room that is furnished and prepared. And then you know what? What it says in verse 16, it says this. It says, and they found it. And he, oh, as he had said unto them. So everything, obviously, that Jesus says is going to come to pass. He sits there and he tells them about the donkey. He says, go over here. There's a donkey. It's tied up over here. And if somebody comes out, to, you know, to say, say, the master needs it. He did that on Palm Sunday. And it's amazing how many miracles Jesus is just doing in this one week. And the disciples don't get it. They don't understand it. But I would say, you know what, how many times has God spoken to us over and over about something and we still don't get it? I had this arrogant attitude, you know, like when I was newly saved. I would read the Old Testament and I would say, how dumb are the Israelites? God had just done this, this, this. How could you turn your back on? And almost as like I was sitting there thinking about it and I go, you know what, but how many times have I done that? Has God asked me to do something, or he's, uh, you know, he's shown me in his word, hey, do this, this, and I just immediately went out and, and did something else. And God's like, I told you to do this, and you did that. And so, but Jesus, what he says, he always does. This is how you, uh, you can also figure out a false prophet or a false teacher. Because you have all these ones on YouTube and on TV and on TBN and all these other places, these ones that are saying that they're a prophet, that they're a bishop, that they're all these things. And they say, well, I'm going to prophesy. And then one person goes, well, you know what? You know what? They're generally right. Or, you know what? That one time, what they prophesied was true. Do you know how many times in the Bible that if you prophesied wrong, that they, get, they, got, they were allowed to kill you? If you, quote-unquote, prophesied wrongly, you said the wrong thing and it did not happen, they had the right to kill you then, right then and there. Not like, well, eventually they'll get it right. That's why I say oftentimes when somebody comes and say, well, God spoke to me about you. I'm like, oh, really? If God has not spoken to you about the same thing, run. If God's word does not say anything about that, Run. And the thing is, is that even if you feel like God has spoken to you about that, but you haven't backed it up with God's word, you better go check God's word to make sure that it's right. So the application in this one, is, as far as what we see in here, that Judas sells out that you know uh, sells out Jesus for thirty pieces of silver, is don't sell out to the praise of the crowds. Do you realize how many like rock stars and actors? that what they are going for is the high of the praises of the people. Rock stars love to go out, and they love to have concerts, and they love to, to have all these things so they can have people going, yeah, woo! And that's the reason why they do it, is because they want to hear the crowd roar for them, to sing their praises. 
It's very dangerous for you have a, uh, to have people in your life that think the exact same way as you do on things. Do you know why? Because it's an echo chamber. You hear the same things that you want to hear. Nobody ever points anything out you know, that maybe you're not doing right or wrong. You need to have somebody in there that also is going to give you wise counsel and look at all different angles in your life. Because if you're sitting there going, you know what, nothing seems to be going on in my life, also check the people around you. If they're telling you what you want to hear, you need to go to somebody else that you're going to say, I need somebody to tell me critically, am, is, am I doing things rightly? And if everybody's always telling you the same thing, you're awesome, you're amazing, everything in your life is beautiful, you know, you keep doing this, you keep whatever. I understand encouragement. I'm not saying that you should be a discouragement to people. Because some people think that's a, you know, a spiritual gift, the gift of discouragement. They think that they need to tear somebody down so they can build them back up again. I'm talking about the fact that if, you know what, if somebody, you know, people keep telling you the same thing and things aren't going right in, you know, in your life and everything else, Get somebody else's opinion. Somebody else that, you know, that's going to tell you how it is, not how you want to hear it. So in other words, don't sell out to the praise of the crowds. Next, one, we want to look at the Last Supper. This is when communion is instituted, uh, instituted in verses 17 uh, through 31. In verse 17, according to the Jewish calendar again, this is the start of Wednesday. So for us, it was Wednesday evening. We look at it as, that is Wednesday morning, but this is the end, you know, for them, uh, this is the beginning of their day. So as we, uh, let's, let's read uh, verses 18 through 21. Verses 18 through 21. It says, And as they, sought, uh, as they sat and did eat, Jesus uh, said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and uh, to say uh, unto him, One by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes, as it is written uh, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of God is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. Those are powerful words to think about it. Jesus is, you know, obviously is saying that, you know what, what he's about to do, it's going to be better for him if he had never been born. Because where he's going is far worse. Where he's going is far worse. And so, but, you know, as he says that, you know, part of says, why would, the question is, why would Jesus say this about Judas Iscariot? We know that it's Judas Iscariot. But why would he say this if according to the, uh, the chosen, if you don't know the chosen, is you know, show out there that's got the Bible wrong. It says it's about Jesus, but it's, if you guys want to know, it's actually, you know who it's funded through is the, uh, is the Mormons. And also, uh, who was the other one? Um, I think I'm forgetting about you know the, the Mormons and the Catholic Church. That's who it is. And so, it's a show on the people go, oh, this is the greatest thing. Well, in the show, Judas Iscariot, the actor himself, comes out and says, you know, Judas is misunderstood. Judas, you know, actually had the purest of intentions. He actually wanted to do what God would have for him. He actually wanted to do what Jesus you know, told him to do, but then he just kind of like messed up. He had the purest of intentions. I say, you know what, that's a bunch of malarkey. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says. If you want to, flip over to John chapter 6, and I'm going to show you that Judas was evil from the beginning. He did not have the purest of intentions. He did not have, you know, the, the best attitude or anything else. So in John chapter 6, verse 64 the Bible says this, but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they, uh, they were that, uh, that believed not, and who should betray him. Skip down to verse 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? And people say, you know what, well, he doesn't know who it is. Jesus has no idea. Why would you say it's Judas Iscariot that he's talking about? Well, let me look. Next verse. He spank of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. 
For, it was, for he it was that should betray him, being out one of the twelve. So what does he say about him? That Judas was a liar from the beginning. That he was evil from the beginning. That he never believed. He was never saved. Judas was, so for those who, you know, I, I, when I was looking up some of this stuff, I saw people, so was Judas really saved and then he just lost his salvation? No, he was never saved. He was never saved. What does he say? He says, For Jesus knew from the beginning who they, who they were that believed not and who should betray him. If you have not believed, you are not saved. He didn't get saved and all of a sudden backslide or whatever, however people want to say this. He was never saved in the first place. So don't believe you know, the Hollywood lies you know, that, that Judas had the appearance of intention because, like I said, he was never saved. The Bible, Jesus himself says that he is a devil. In fact, I want you to look at Psalm 109. Psalm 109 is prophesied about Judas and is actually considered to be one of the most controversial you know, portions of Scripture in the Bible. Psalm 109. I'll wait for you to get there. I'm going to take a drink. Psalm 109, starting at verse 6. The Bible says, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When, uh, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and, le uh, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek uh, their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner uh, catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any uh, to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Does that seem a little vindictive and ruthless? Seems a little vindictive and ruthless. You know why it sounds that way? Because it is. Because this is written about Judas, and you say, well, how is that? Well, so for one thing, does not another take his office as, uh, as an apostle? Matthias does. But the thing is, that the Bible refers to Judas as the son of perdition, and why Jesus says that it were, uh, that this is, and this is the reason why it would have been uh, better for him if he had never been born. I mean, think about what it says in there. He says, you know, basically, I'm not going to, you know, only take it out on him. But he says, you know what? Your children are going to have an issue. You know, uh, let, the, let God remember the iniquity of his fathers. I mean, think about, like, all the things that he is saying that is going to happen to him. And this is the reason why it says that, you know, that Judas, it would have been better for him if he had never been born. Everything that you know about Judas says, you know what, that he was a reprobate, and the fact is, is that he is one, and uh, uh, and obviously the son of perdition that he could not turn because this is what he did. And the Bible even talks about the fact of you know what, the devil entering him. You say, well, that's later on. That's that's right after he decides to sell Jesus. But didn't Jesus already say that he says, you know what, I know that you're not going to believe. Did he not tell him? He says, I knew from the beginning that he, that he wasn't going to believe. I knew it. Let's look down at verses 20, uh, 25, uh, 22 through uh, 25. This is where Jesus institutes uh, communion with his disciples. And uh, this is why we take communion today, right? He starts this off, and we, uh, we continue that practice. We, we see that over in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, you know, eleven sixteen 16, that we are to remember the Lord's death until he comes again, right? Jesus, you know, shows us all this. Down in, uh, uh, down in verses 27 and, uh, through 31, Jesus tells his disciples, all of them, that they would be offended or that they would be displeased because of him. And what do they all say? It's not just Peter. 
all of them say, I would never do it. The only reason why we focus on Peter is because Peter opens up his mouth even more and says things. But all of them say, you know, Jesus, I would never leave you. I would never. Even if all this, I'll never leave you. But because of him, it says, uh, it says uh, because of him, this, or later that night, they will scatter. And as verse 28 says, you know, the funny thing is, is that Jesus tells them all, he says, you're all going to scatter. But in verse 28, he gives them hope. What does he tell them? He says, but after that, I am risen. How many times does Jesus tell his disciples that he is going to die and rise again? Several times. Several times throughout the you know, Gospel of Mark. I think there's three times where he blatantly comes out and says, I am going to die, but, in, but I'm going to raise again in three days. Other times he alludes to it and he talks about it, but the thing is, that, why does this matter? Because the thing is, because kids are not the only ones that don't listen. We oftentimes think that kids are the only ones that don't listen, but the disciples are right, you know, right here, and we're right there with them. I'll speak on behalf of, of men. How many times has your wife said something to you? And she'll come, she'll come back and say, did you do that? And you say, well, you never said anything. She says, yes, I did. I say this because my wife, I'm thinking of several times this past week, she says, I've already told you. And I said, no, you didn't. She says, yes, you did. You, uh, you're, and, she, and she will give the play-by-play -play of what was happening. And then so then I try to justify it. And say, oh, well, I was busy at the time. That's the reason why I didn't hear you. But she did. So in this case, Jesus over and over again tells them, you know what, I'm going to die, but when I rise again. But why, you know, so we begin to you know, wonder, why is it that when he rises, all of a sudden they're amazed, they're surprised. He told them that it was going to happen. He tells them it over and over and over again. But Peter, like I said, he takes it to another level. He actually begins to argue with Jesus. Let's look at verses 28 through 31. The Bible says this. It says, But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. He's like, you know what? All these other ones are going to be displeased. All these other ones are going to scatter. Not me. I won't do it. Verse 30, it says, And Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this day, even in this night before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake there more vehemently. He says, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee, uh, deny thee in, any, uh, in any wise. Likewise also said they all. So all of them were saying, he goes, you know what? If they all leave you and everything else, I won't. He says, I'll even go to the death, but I won't deny you. And later on, that actually comes true. That it's also a prophecy of later on because the thing is, is that later on in his life, he will die for Christ. Peter is actually known as the apostle that died upside down. They actually crucified him upside down because he felt it not worthy to die in the same way as his Savior. He did not want to die upon a cross the same way as Jesus. He said, you know what? He said, I would rather it be upside down. And so that they honored his request and crucified Peter upside down. What can we learn from this? God knows you better than you know yourself. Where you can say, I will never do this. I will never, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will never backslide. I will never. God knows you better than you know yourself. This is one of the reasons why, like, you know, for me, it's, it's hard to, you know, sometimes to have an altar call because I don't want you to come up here and making this proclamation to the Lord and then you all of a sudden walking back on it. Because the Bible says that if you're going to make an oath, keep it. If you're going to make a pledge, keep it. We have a hard enough time. Like, let's, let's think about it. It's a great and awesome thing that we can't lose our salvation, Right? Because if we could lose it, we probably would have probably a million times by now, probably even more than that, probably countless times. That's the reason why I think you know, it's awesome that it's all upon the Lord. That when He saves you, He saves you. I don't do anything. You know why? 
I believe on him. I trust in him. I put my full faith and trust in him. But you know why? Because I can't keep it. I can't keep it. If I could keep it, then I wouldn't need Jesus. You wouldn't need Jesus. Let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to fly through these last three pages. When this event takes place, it is approximately 1 o'clock in the morning. This is where Jesus was extremely uh, terrified and fearful. The Bible actually says that he began to be sore amazed and to be heavy, very heavy, and sorrowful unto death. In other words, that he is overwhelmed, he is heavy hearted by what? The fact of what he has to go through to save you and I. Verse 32 says, And they came to a place which is named Gethsemane, and uh, said to, uh, to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he, uh, he takes with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on, uh, on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what, uh, what, uh, what thou wilt. In other words, not what, not what I want, but what God wants. We need to sit there and realize, and you can sense the anguish and the heaviness that he has. And the thing is, is that as you go on and you begin to read this, the next verse, what ends up happening? Peter, James, and John fall asleep. He just told them that he was going to die. He just showed them the anguish and the heaviness that he had, that he was sore, amazed, that he had all these things. And they're like, I'm sleeping. Well, can, you know, and some people will say, well, you know what, shame on them. Well, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. It's 1 o'clock in the morning that, you know, all this stuff is happening. But the thing is, is that aren't you glad that your salvation depends on Jesus and not you? We fall asleep, but you know what? Jesus keeps fighting for us. If we sit there and we, we there's times, you know, honestly, where I've, sat by my, I've knelt by my bedside and I'm praying before I go to bed. And I could, you know, I could try to make a joke and say that I was in the spirit, but no, I was sleeping. And I wake up an hour later, and I'm like, "Amen," you know, just trying to like, you know, wipe the crusties off my eyes. Am I the only one in here that it's ever happened to? I'm just saying. I... But we look at verse 38, and he says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye uh, uh, enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. We must deny daily or crucify our flesh daily so we can be spirit-led. When we get up in the morning, that's why, you know, as soon as we get out, there's some people, you know, they will get out of bed right away, hit the floor, you know, uh, you know, their knees hit the floor, and they're out there praying. And the thing is, is that even with that, we know that that day there's somebody needs something that we come up short in. We need to continually crucify the flesh daily throughout the day as we're going and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So in other words, you know, when we wake up in the morning, don't hit the snooze alarm. Don't hit your snooze. But get up, read the word, and pray. Here's the thing. If you fight eating food, or some, for some, I, I could probably say it this way, is that you're not fighting the fact of, uh, of fighting food. The, the food, you know, is more under attack. I would say it this, you know, that way. Then you know what? Crucify the flesh and say, you know what? I am going to only eat this much, and that's how much I'm going to go with. Or the fact that you say, you know what? Stop eating the candy and the pop and the junk food and eat something healthy instead. I understand where you're coming from because people say, you know what, all the healthy food doesn't taste good and all the bad food tastes wonderful. You know, the reason why, you know, a little health lesson is because you've trained your taste buds so it would taste better than healthy food. 
Once you, you know, start eating healthier food and everything else, then all of a sudden you're going back and like, oof, man, there's a whole lot of sugar in this. There's a whole lot of, and then you begin to realize it. If you have a problem with saying things that you shouldn't say, get into God's word. Study and memorize his word. And stay away from those who influence you in that way. Because you know what? The people you hang around, oftentimes that's who you talk like. But if you're hanging around God's word, you're reading and you're memorizing it, God's word's going to come out of your mouth, right? Kind of like how it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So whatever you bring in is going to come out. However you live your life, whoever you surround yourself life, you know, in your life with, that's going to come out in your life. And you know what? Yes, you know, some people say, you know, I, I hang around these bad people, but God's able to keep me. You know what? Eventually, you're going to give in. Surround yourself with people that are not going to get you in trouble. And you ever heard of guilty by association? A police officer can, you know, can arrest you for that just because you're there. You may not have done anything, but because of who you're hanging out with, it often t- uh, it, they're going to take you away as well. And the thing is, I brought up a couple of examples, but this could be anything in your life that takes precedence or precedence over Jesus, like money, or if you have like relationships, or you know, TV, work, any of those things. Because some people will sit there and say, "Well, I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to read my Bible because I have to work." Or because I have, you know, this relationship that I have. Or because, you know, this TV show was on and I just wanted to watch the end of it. I've heard all kinds of excuses. But whatever's important to you, you put that, you know, top priority in your life, right? So here's the application. As Christians, we will fail. But that's no excuse for willfully sinning. That's no reason to willfully sin. Because... I've been around people that will sit there and they will begin to talk and, and they will say, I'm going to go to church. And then the next time you talk to them, they didn't show up at church. Well, this came up. You know, I really wanted to be there, this or this, or, you know, and other reasons. Or I really wanted to read my Bible, or I really wanted to go and, and, and pray for this person, but. I'm talking about like, you know, the fake phony excuses. I'm not talking about, oh, you're involved in a car accident. Oh, that's a lame excuse. No, it's not a lame excuse. You're in a car accident. Or you got stuck at a train, you know, a train going by. That's not a lame excuse. I'm talking about those lame ones that people come up with. And some of you are probably thinking of some ones that you've heard. Or well, maybe some that you've actually used. Next we see that everything, you know, this whole entire situation is sealed with a kiss. Judas tells the chief priests, the scribes, and elders, Who, uh, whomsoever I shall kiss, that uh, same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. Why do you think he's telling him this? It's dark. I know that you've, you've watched movies and stuff like that. You probably watched Passion of the Christ and they're all coming around with torches and it's all well lit because, you know, you have to see it because it's on the TV screen. But it's dark. No matter if you have a torch or not, it's dark. And the thing is, is that, you know what, he's saying, you know what, I want to make sure you get the right one. I don't want there to be a problem. And so this kind of goes against the whole like Muslim theory that, you know, that that wasn't really Jesus. It was a lookalike that they put up on the cross. Or the fact that the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that say that, well, that, you know, this really actually wasn't Jesus. It was somebody else. And so then, like like I said, Judas runs up to uh, to Jesus, kisses him on the cheek. And just for those that go, ew, gross, why is a guy kissing a guy on the cheek? And This is a common greeting. Actually, if you go across, you know, over into Europe, this is a common greeting. That there will be people that will, instead of shaking hands, they give a a person a kiss on the cheek. That's why the Bible says also to greet one another with a holy kiss. To give them a... uh, this is a, you know, a, a greeting that they normally would have, uh, would have used. But the thing is, as soon as Judas does this, they grab uh, Jesus to take him away. And we know that you know, Peter comes over and he, and he cuts off one of the guy's ears. And Jesus comes over, picks up his ear, and heals him and puts his ear back on. But they take Jesus away, and he's taken to the high priest for this fake trial, this mistrial that's going to happen. Here's a, you know, you can use this application as well. People will lie about you behind your back, but then they will welcome you to your face. 
People will talk all kinds of stuff behind your back, but then it's coming to you, put a smile on their face, and say, hey, man, how's it going? Let's look at this, I label this next point as a dog and pony show. A dog and pony show. This is the mistrial of Jesus. This happens between 2 o'clock and, uh, and 6 a.m. This is, it actually transitions, and now we're in the day of suffering. We're going to begin to see Jesus suffer. So what do I mean by a dog and pony show? A dog and pony show, it literally means to be entertained. It oftentimes it was a, a circus of small animals. And it was, and, you know, oftentimes looked at as being an, an elaborate or overblown affair or an event. So in other words, this is just basically just so they can say that they had a trial. They want to kill him, but they need to have a reason. They have to have a trial to say, okay, well, he went through this, and he did this, this, and this, so they can go ahead. So this is basically you know, just so they can say, well, he did this, he said this. And so we read in, in verses 55 through 57 of Mark 14, it says, And the chief priest and all the council sought for, uh, for witness against Jesus uh, to put him uh, to death and found none. So they found no reason. It says, for many a bear false witness against them, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against them. So we see this. There's a bunch of false accusations. There's even them you know, uh, taking Jesus' words and twisting them. Because what they uh, will say is, you know, Jesus, when Jesus points to the temple, he says, you know what? This temple will be destroyed, but I will rebuild it in three days. They add on the part that says, he says that he will rebuild this temple in three days with his hands. He never said that. He just said, I'm going to rebuild this temple in three days. And he wasn't speaking of the actual physical temple. He's saying, he's talking about his body, the one that actually, you know, his body being, you know, his, his body broken and his, his blood being shed for, the, for us so that way we can have forgiveness of our sins. Amen? That's what he is talking about. He's talking about the temple of his body. We skip down to verse 59, it says, But neither so did their witnesses agree together. They had a whole bunch of accusations, they had all this stuff, and nothing, nothing agreed. That no matter how many times they had false witnesses, somebody would come in and say something different. It would be a completely different story, over and over again. Verse 61, it says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? He says he asked him again. He asked this over and over again. Why is he answering this question? When he, says, he, when he asks this question, he says, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? He's saying, Are you the Messiah? Are you the anointed one? Are you the one that we have been waiting for? And the, the fact of the Son of the Blessed is the same thing that they were talking about on Palm Sunday. Ble- Hosanna literally means, blessed is he that comes in what? In the name of the Lord. Ble- that he is blessed. And so we look at this and we see the fact that Jesus keeps his peace. What does it mean? He doesn't open up his mouth. He doesn't say a word or anything to him. And then here's the thing. How he answers because so many times you'll get a, you know, a false religion or a cult come up to you and say, Jesus never said that he was God. How many of you ever heard that? I know I have countless times. But let's look at it. When he, let's look at verse 61, then we'll go on to verse 62. It says, but he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, And said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Other other gospels say, I am that I am. He is flat out telling them, I am God. Because they know the Christ. They know that the Messiah. They know those titles. As soon as he says, I am, he is declaring that he is God. He is declaring that he is the deliverer. He is declaring that he is the Savior. He is declaring that he is the only one that can save him. They don't like it because they want a political person. They want a politician. They want a king that's going to help them rule on earth. And Jesus is saying, no, I rule in the kingdom of God. 
I give you eternal life. He gives them something better. And the thing is, is that for at least false religions and cults who say that he never says that he is God, he flat out says, I am. And what does he do? He quotes back to Mark 13, where he is talking about the end times, where he is saying the Son of Man is going to do what? Come on the clouds. What does it say? And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. And coming in the clouds of heaven, he goes back to his prophecy about how he was coming back and the rapture of the church. Who can do that? Who is the only one? God. Who is the only one that can do that? Jesus Christ. So for those false teachers and those false religions saying that he never declared it, he does. He says it. He flat out tells them, and they still reject him. And what ends up happening is that the, uh, the high priest says that Jesus has spoken blasphemy. Do you know why? Because they realize what he's saying, that he is God. Blasphemy, blasphemy literally means that you're speaking profanely or disrespectful of God, that you're basically you know, equating yourself to be God. And so the fact is that he, him declaring blasphemy is the fact that he's affirming what Jesus already declared, that he is God. But, you know, Jesus never says that he's God. Here's the application in this area. Most people have a hard time handling the truth. And some people will never accept it. This is something that we need to realize because there's often times where we'll share the gospel with somebody over and over and over again, telling them who Jesus is, and some people will never accept it. And it's so easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, right? We've had people that we talked to, and they've uh, they've come out and said, it can't be that easy. Well, let me see. When Jesus said that a child is able to do it, do you think a child is going to do all these these other things that most people think that you have to do in order to be saved? Like, repent of all your sins, get water baptized, do, I mean, just all, uh, have church attendance, everything else then tell me why the thief on the cross is able to get saved when he didn't do any of those. Well, Jesus made an exception for him. Oh, so Jesus plays favorites now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's a simple thing, but a lot of people will not accept that. It's too easy for them. They want to work their way to heaven, and you don't do that. You can't work your way to heaven. Lastly, we look at Peter's denial. In verses 67 through 71, Peter denies Jesus three times as Jesus had prophesied. Jesus told him this. Verse 71, Peter is so infuriated. I mean, look at verse 71. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. What does curse and to swear mean? Do you guys know what cuss words are, you know, curse words are and, and swear words are? He becomes so infuriated that people keep connecting him to Jesus. And I don't know if it's the fact that maybe he thought that if he acknowledged that the fact that he knows Jesus, that he was around with him for three years, that he thought, well, if I do that, they're probably going to do the same thing to me. They might kill me. They might crucify me. They may do all these things to me. I don't know if that's going through his mind, but he begins to, uh, to curse and to swear. And Peter remembers what Jesus told him that he would do, that he would do this. Peter even argued, remember, he even argued with Jesus that he would never deny Jesus in the first place. And so because of that, he remembers all that, and Peter begins to, you know, Peter is heartbroken, and he begins to weep. Do you know the difference between what Peter does and what Judas does? Because we know that, you know, uh, Peter is restored. We see this in John chapter, you know, John chapter 20. Peter is restored. Jesus tells him over and over again, you know, he says, he asks him, do you love me? He says, you know I love you. You know why? Because Peter's saved. He says, do you love me? He says, you know that I am. Feed my sheep over and over again. He restores him. 
Judas, on the other hand, because he was never saved. Judas weeps, but he was never saved in the first place. He was a reper, but he could never be saved. And what does he do? He goes and commits suicide. Now, listen to me when I say that. I am not saying that every single person that you know, commits suicide is going to hell. And I can prove to you from the Bible, I don't have time this morning you know, to tell you that, but not every person that commits suicide goes to hell. You say, well, that's you know, true. No, it's not. If you look at you know, King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 28, we know King Saul at first did wonderful things for the Lord, right? He's God's chosen king, correct? Does everything that God wants him to do, and then somewhere along the line he backslides, and he begins to like, want to kill David. He wants to do all these bad and evil things, right? You say, well, obviously he's got to go to hell because look at what he did. He lost his salvation. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 28. When, when he goes to the, the witch at Endor, which, think about that, he's visiting a witch, which he's not supposed to do. She somehow conjures up uh, the you know, prophet, Samuel, right? And Samuel goes, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. And Samuel looks at him and says, you know what? He says, tomorrow you will be with me and your sons will be also. Now, where is Samuel the prophet? He's in heaven, right? So why would he make a statement of saying, you and your sons are going to be with me tomorrow? For one thing, he's telling them you're going to die tomorrow, okay? So you have that case. Another one, you have, uh, you have uh, Samson. Everybody knows the story of Samson. Strength is in his hair, all that kind of stuff, and, and whatever. He finally, you know, uh, toys around and plays around with Delilah so many times. He goes like, and finally tells her to cut off his hair. He loses all his strength, right? Has his go eyes gouged out, correct? But remember, he did all these wonderful things beforehand, right? So he's a believer. Did something stupid, right? And then he looks and he says, Lord, strengthen me that I may basically that I may push these pillars down and have it come down upon me if you've ever looked at the, the pillars that were there back then he wasn't saying oh so this you know this tiny house can fall on me or like the houses that we have would fall on me when a lot of times you know if they fall on a person still lives right now these are stones these are pillars and he knows that when he asks the Lord to give him strength one last time so he can bring down the house, basically, he knows he's going to die. And where are, they, where are these ones located? Well, I can tell you, you know, Samson is in the hall of faith. You want someone else? Elijah asked God to take his life. There can come a point in your life for some people that they get so depressed that for them, they can't seem to figure out a way. They are saved. They love the Lord. They go to church, and oftentimes, they'll paint a, a, a smiling, you know, smiling face when they go to church. But sometimes, they get to that point to where they are so sorrowful that they don't see a way out, and the only way out that they, they, they see is that way. Am I telling you, oh, yeah, go ahead and go kill yourself? No, I am not telling you that. I am telling you that in a believer's life, sometimes you can get to that point you know, a person can get to that point to where they are so sorrowful and so depressed that they don't see a point to living anymore. But oftentimes in church, we ridicule a person that is at that point because of the fact they're saying, you know what? No, you just need to like, you know, deny it and you know, put a smiling face on so that way everybody thinks you're okay. We have, a, we have a whole a lot of churches out there where there's a whole lot of people that are depressed and at that point, and the thing is that they're told to keep their mouth shut because I don't want you to bring down how happy I feel. Which, in fact, what we could do instead of having that attitude is come alongside of them and build them up and try to encourage them and try to help bring them out of that funk. But like I say, sometimes people don't ever get to that point. They're at that point, and they end up doing the inevitable. They haven't lost their salvation, but the thing is, is that they, they've, they've done that physical, that natural, you know, that, you know what we, I don't want to say natural consequence, but they've done that which we would think, why would you do that? But they've gotten to that part, you know, that place where they just can't seem to get out of it. 
And so I just want you to realize and, and, and you know, uh, think about these things. But Peter and Judas have these things. And I say that all to say this. Judas could never have been saved. Why? He was a son of perdition. He never wanted to get saved. He was never about it. And if you want to go back, a devil had entered him. There was no way he was going to get saved. Like he was on that point. So what's the application to all this thing? I, I added some of that you know, on this part. Here's the application. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. Better to remain silent and be thought of, uh, thought of fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. Do you know where he got that statement from? He got it from the Bible. Proverbs chapter, uh, 20, uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. It says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So I want you to realize, I'm going to go back through those points, you know, that I went through all these applications. And I want you to realize that in these, you know, if you feel any of these, realize, know that God is right there with you, that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. Don't be a sellout. Don't do what Judas did. But if you know what, if you say, you know what, I had a big mouth and I told the Lord this and I'm in that funk and I'm in this area and, you know, whatever, know that Jesus is right there. You notice that when he realizes Jesus, you know, looks back at him and he doesn't say a word to him. He doesn't say, I told you so. He doesn't do all that. He restores Peter. So number one was this. You do what God's word tells you to do because you love and worship him. Don't listen to the naysayers. Number two, don't sell out to the praise of the crowds. Number three, God knows you better than you know yourself. Number four, as Christians, we will fail, but that's no excuse to willfully sin. Number five, people will lie about you behind your back, but then welcome you. Number six, most people have a hard time handling the truth, and some people will never accept it. And number seven, even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And he uh, that shuts, uh, shuts his lips is esteemed as a man of understanding. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, better to remain a, a silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. In other words, this encapsulates everything. Keep standing up for, uh, for being a Christian. Because what he says is the only thing that really matters. And you will never live, uh, sorry, and you will live without regret. When you when you listen to what he says, you will never have a regret in your life. But when you follow the crowds, your life will be full of regrets. When you listen to what the crowd tells you, your life will be full of regrets. You'll always look back and say, I should have done this, and I should have done that, and I should have done this. But keep standing up for being a Christian. Keep seeking him. Keep following him. Keep uh, uh, on that path. And you know what? When you're doing what he asks you to do, you'll never have a regret. It's only when you listen to the naysayers that your life is full of regret. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you, and I, Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I pray that uh, everyone in here, that, that they would not be a, a sellout, that they would not uh, sell out to the crowds and what they would, and what the crowds would tell them to do. But Lord, that they would uh, seek after you and they would follow you, that they would be spirit-led and follow um, what your word uh, truly says. And God, and if there are those in here this morning that are like Peter, that have maybe have stuck their foot in their mouth or, you know, uh, and, and they regret it, Lord, I pray that this morning that they would come to you knowing, God, that you will restore them. That you will take their life and you will use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.